I was uh, sitting in the offices of World Vision in Ramallah. Uh, World Vision, as you may know, is an international NGO. It's a Christian NGO. It does humanitarian and development work all over the world. Um, its roots are evangelical. And Ramallah is the de facto capital of the Palestinian Authority, which is the government of the Palestinian uh, Authority, government of the State of Israel. And I put that in quotes because I believe, and most Palestinians will agree with me, that it's a, a government the same way that the Vichy government was the government of the people of France, in Vichy France. I mean, it was, it was a part of the occupation. It was part of the occupying power. It did not work for the people. And I think that that's the situation in Palestine today. They do not have a government that represents them. They do not have a polity. And then they don't have an army. But Ramallah has been established as sort of the de facto capital. <clears throat> and that's where the NGOs, the international NGOs, are set up. And I'm sitting in the office of a woman named Lana Abu Hijla, who is uh, the, um, the director, the head of World Vision in, Palestine, in the West Bank and Gaza. And this was in 2009, March, April of 2009, right after the, what some people call the, the Gaza War. This is Operation Cast Lead. This was the first bombardment, major bombardment and incursion on Gaza. Uh, in which about 1,400 civilians died. Just a lead up to what happened just this past summer. And uh, we were talking and she was telling me about the problems that she was having getting her people into Gaza. Um, they were suffering horribly there and she couldn't get in and she couldn't get uh, help for them. So she was telling me this and, uh, and then she told me a story that I know she wanted me to repeat. And I think it opens a chapter in the first book, and I tell the story all the time. She lives in um, Jerusalem, in um, a northern suburb of Jerusalem called Beit Hanina, which is, I believe, still, the last time we looked, it was still part of the West Bank. It had not yet been gobbled up by Jewish Greater Jerusalem. And the wall runs right along there. The, the, it's called by many names, separation barrier, apartheid wall. Uh, the, the Israelis call it the separation wall, just for your information. In Hebrew, that's what it's called. But it's a land grab wall. It's also a very important psychological wall, which I will talk about in a moment. So she commutes from north suburb of Jerusalem to Ramallah every day. It's about five miles. If you've got the right license plates, which she does because she works for an international NGO, you can make it in about 20 minutes or so. If you don't, it can take hours with checkpoints. So she makes this commute every day, and often she has her, eight, at the time, her eight-year-old daughter with her. One day, they were driving along, and the wall, which basically cuts deeply into Palestinian land, and it just runs right along this, this road. How many people have seen this wall? Yeah. And many, the rest of you probably have seen pictures of it. People who have seen, who saw the Berlin Wall said that that was nothing compared to this wall. It's a big, ugly thing, about almost 30 feet high. It pretty much accompanies you on the entire trip, north and south from, Ramallah, from Jerusalem to Ramallah and back. And her daughter turns to her one day, and you know eight-year-olds will just come out with the most amazing things out of the blue, right? She said, Mommy, why did they make the Jews live behind that wall? Now, it's an important story, at least for me, because this little girl was saying something very profound. She's Palestinian. She doesn't know that the wall is there to steal her land, to carve up her country, and to basically make her a prisoner of her own country. She doesn't know that. But what she sees is the truth, because the Palestinians will get their freedom. This is a situation that cannot continue. Uh, as Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, famously said, the arc of history is long, but it bends toward freedom. <laughs> They're going to get there. But most importantly, 
And I don't idealize Palestinians any more than I idealize any other peoples, although I love them dearly. They know who they are. They know what their current suffering is about. It's about being Arab. It's about being part of a subaltern civilization in today's Western, you know, the oriented civilizations. Um, it's about what the West, the colonial West, has been doing to the Arab world for hundreds of years. They know what this is about. And they know who they are. And even with all of the indignity and all of the humiliation, they have not lost their dignity, and they have not turned to fear and to hatred, and with some exceptions, to violence. The real prisoners of that wall are my people, the Jewish people. They live behind a wall of what I have come to call a wall of soul-killing racism and fear. And that's what that wall is doing there. That wall says to my cousins, literally my cousins, I have a huge family there, and my friends, on the other side of that wall is danger. On the other side wall of that wall is the enemy. On the other side of that wall is the other. You must not go there. That is not your world. That's killing my people. When I stood in front of that wall for the first time in a, uh, a neighborhood of Jerusalem in 2006, not that long ago, I stood in front of it for the first time. I went there with the Fellowship of Reconciliation. And it's a big, ugly thing, as walls like that are. And it was horrible to look at, and it had basically destroyed an entire neighborhood and turned it into a garbage heap and a dead street. So I felt horrible standing in front of it, but something else happened inside me that was more horrible and more upsetting. Because I realized standing in front of that wall, that, that was the wall that had been built inside me. That was the wall that ran through the middle of my heart from childhood. And that this was the inevitable physical manifestation of that same wall. Now, let me be very clear. Even though I do a lot of speaking to churches and I preach on Sunday mornings from the lectionary and people get kind of confused and say, well, when did you convert to Christianity? And that's another story. I have not. I am Jewish. And I always will be. And I love being Jewish. And I value my identity. And I value my tradition. And I value my heritage. And I love my people. But like with any powerful identity and affiliation and faith tradition, there is a dark side. And it applies to any faith tradition. And Jews are no exception. The dark side for me as a Jew was that I learned that the world was a dangerous place and that I had enemies. In fact, anybody who wasn't Jewish was an enemy. Now, I understand where that comes from. You know, I was born in mid-20th century America in Philadelphia in a fairly liberal environment. I did not, to my knowledge, experience any direct or overt anti-Semitism. But it was as if my grandmother's DNA was like operating in me. Goyim, you know what Goyim are? That's all you guys. That's the nations. That's the, it's from the Bible. It has a stronger connotation in modern Jewish parlance. The Goyim are basically the dangerous other, a drunken, ignorant, murderous rabble. That's how my grandmother felt about it. That's what she brought with her from Europe. True enough for her. True enough for the Jews in Europe that at the end of the 19th century decided they needed Zionism. But I got that. I learned that I had two enemies, primary, chief enemies among the general world, which was the enemy. That was the German people because of what they had done to us, and the Arabs, as we called them, because of what they would do to us if we didn't have Israel. So I'm standing in front of this wall that is to, built to protect me from this 
merciless, implacable, eternal enemy. And I realize that I'm standing in front of this wall because I'm there to go over to the other side of it, to make it go away for me. And I literally crossed over. I went to the other side. I met the Palestinians. That was the whole point of this trip. And I met this enemy, this enemy that didn't hate me, that didn't want to kill me, that welcomed me. Have you ever tried to refuse an offer of Arab hospitality? That said, thank you for coming. Thank you for being here. Let's talk. Did not hate me. Most importantly, did not fear me. Angry, yes. Bitter, yes. Confused, frustrated, but never giving up and welcoming me. Let's live together. That's the Palestinian people. Now, when we get to Q&A, ask the Hamas question, and we'll talk about Hamas. Okay. Not true for my cousins, friends, brothers, sisters, uncles, and aunts in what we like to call pre-1967 west of the Green Line Israel, which it doesn't even exist anymore politically. Who are the prisoners? And just don't know who these people are. And who live behind a wall of fear, a, we, a fear that is uh, perpetuated and exploited by their government. We know what that's like. There are, um, so I mean, what I want to try to get across is that I think um, you know, the name of the organization that invited me was the Voices for Palestinian uh, Freedom, Liberation, Rights. Rights. Uh, you know, about two sentences into whatever it is I'm going to say, when I, people will automatically say, okay, well, he's pro-Palestine, that must mean he's anti-Israel. I said this to the folks this afternoon. I mean, I reject those categories. Uh, I'm, as I said, I think the Palestinian people are going to get where they need to go. If I'm here for anybody, I'm here for my own people who are in deep trouble um, and who need to be liberated from the uh, toxic soul-killing system and country that they live in uh, just as much as their Palestinian victims, maybe in some ways even more so. So if you want to pigeonhole me, then call me pro-Israel. Call me the most pro-Israel person you may meet. There's a... Uh, Another question that I'm often asked, which is, well, okay, so it sounds like you don't really believe in the two-state solution, so you must be a one-stater. And what I have come to say to that question and to everything that it implies is, I'm not having the one-state, two-state conversation anymore. That's part of our problem. The whole two-state thing is a snare and a delusion. Uh, we don't have the possibility of two states, not under the current conditions. That's gone. Uh, Israel, which is not occupying Palestine, but which is colonizing the entire territory, has already accomplished that. And the map of uh, historic Palestine from the Mediterranean to the Jordan today resembles very closely the map that was being drawn by the government of South Africa by the 80s, which was a set of black African enclaves completely surrounded by a white minority power structure. And those were the Bantustans, or the homelands, as they were also called. That was one country. We have one state today in historic Palestine. It's called the State of Israel. It's an apartheid state. Our job as Americans, as people of faith, as people who don't claim a faith affiliation but who identify as um, the people who believe in justice, 
and human rights. Our job is to say no to that. By the way, it's not our job to say, well, there should be two states, or there should be a federation, or there should be one you know, multi-ethnic diverse state. I mean, I have my own feelings about what I'd like to see there, and it's the last one on that list. But it's not our job to dictate what that uh, the final status should be. In the case of South Africa, which I will keep returning to, it wasn't the job of the people of the world who, by virtue of their sanctions and their global actions, brought down the government of South Africa and created the opportunity for something new. Nobody said South Africa should, have, should be one multi-ethnic, multi-racial state, or it should be break, broken up into black and white states. They made that decision themselves, and nobody knew what was going to happen in, 19, in, in, in 1994. What happened, happened, and they made their decision. That's where we are today about Israel. We have to say no to that, and it's our responsibility as citizens of the world, and especially as Americans, who built this thing and continue to build this thing and to support it financially and diplomatically. It's our job to say no to that. So the conversation is not between us and Jerusalem or Ramallah. The conversation for us is not between, uh, it's not with the citizens of the state of Israel or even the peace movement in the state of Israel or whoever is representing the Palestinians. Our conversation is between us and our government. And I'm gonna make the case that the churches of the United States, in uh, partnership, collaboration, joint effort, and common cause with labor unions, peace movements, all kinds of other secular, uh, the, the campuses, uh, need to say no to that, and we need to say no to that through uh, responding to the civil, Palestinian civil society call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions, and for direct political advocacy with our elected representatives and with our executive branch. That's what we need to do. And we're getting there. Now, I don't know that I'm holding out hope, but I think if the Palestinians can hope, then we need to be able to hope. The word hope just came up for me uh, just the other day. Uh, on my way here, I, my first stop um, after stopping in Philly where I grew up and having dinner with my brothers was to go to New York and give a talk um, at a church in between two worship services on Sunday morning. Uh, it's a fairly progressive uh, Episcopal church in, in Manhattan. And uh, to his credit, the, uh, the rector had invited me to come and be part and, and give this talk. I think he sort of knew what he was getting into. I spoke to him on the phone before, uh, before Sunday, and he said, I have to uh, confess that I'm a bit anxious because uh, over the summer, um, in my weekly column or blog to my congregation, to my parish, I, uh, I said something about praying for the people of Gaza, and I got hate mail, calling me all kinds of names, anti-Semite, racist, and stupid, apparently. So he said, I'm a little anxious about this. I said, well, welcome to my world, but thank you. Know, Good for you, for doing this anyway. So I came and I gave my talk, and we corresponded a little bit over the last couple of days. And um, he said, you know, some of the things you said shocked me, and I may get into talking about that a bit. Um, I used the G word, talked about genocide. That was shocking to him. Um, but he also said, well, where is hope? And I wrote back to him and I said, here's hope. Hope, first of all, is you. Hope is that you, as the, the rector, the top you know, priest of this church, decided to have me come and speak to anybody who cared to listen in your congregation. 75 people turned up. There's a hunger for this, for straight talk. I said, faith leaders are very, very important. I said, I don't need to tell you the list of key faith leaders who really made a difference in the civil rights movement, in the anti-apartheid movement, in the anti-war movement here in this country. You know, you're on that list now. Congratulations. I said hope also has to do with us speaking the truth. We have lost hope. We have abandoned hope until such time as we are ready 
to speak to and step away from the illusions and the lies that are fed to us about what's real. So when the Church of South Africa, the churches of South Africa in the mid-80s, way down the line, way down the road in the anti-apartheid struggle, but finally stood up and said, we can no longer passively or actively support apartheid. It is a heresy. It goes against the fundamentals of our faith. We can't have a black church and a white church. That's not Christianity. And they wrote a prophetic document called Kairos, a challenge to the church. And the churches of the world, beginning with the World Alliance of Reformed Churches, which is about 500 gazillion different churches across the world, uh, stood in behind them, did the Protestant equivalent of excommunicating the churches, the, the member churches of South Africa, and in seven years, apartheid was gone. It made a difference in terms of the sanctions. The Thatcher government, the Reagan governments were still holding out. When the churches of the world said no to apartheid, it was over. They stopped buying the lie that there could be a good apartheid, that there could be separate but equal. When Martin Luther King Jr. and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, leader joined by the churches of the country and you know, the entire, our entire civil society, said no to Jim Crow. And they weren't just saying no to Jim Crow. They weren't saying no to the flagrant, violent, horrific racism. They were saying no to the progressives who said, let's go slow. Let's work, and this is the context of the letter from Birmingham jail. Let's work with the new mayor of Birmingham. He's a nicer segregationist. That's what the Birmingham, how many of you have read the letter from Birmingham jail in the last eight years? Go back and read it again, all of you. He was saying no to a bunch of, quote, progressive, quote, liberal clergy, clergymen who said, Martin, we love you, we love your cause. Go slow, work with us, we'll get there. And his, that's his answer to it. He said, freedom is never given voluntarily by those who hold the power. And nonviolent direct action is the way. And so for people, for example, and so that was another lie that there can be a kinder, gentler Jim Crow that had to be confronted. We have similar lies that we confront today. And I'm going to talk about them in a second. But you know, the, uh, the, the beginnings of the civil rights movement in this country, in the churches, is what I often refer to when people say, we can't boycott Israel. We can't boycott Israel. And I say, what? It won't work. It won't work. And then there's a whole list of reasons why it won't work. To which my uh, answer is, what word in Montgomery bus boycott do you not understand? It does work. And it's already starting to work. You go to Macy's and try to buy a soda stream. They're not carrying it anymore. They're having trouble selling them. So there are um, a couple of Myths, I actually, I call them lies. In fact, I think it was Mark Twain who said there are lies and there are damn lies. So here's a couple of damn lies. Illusions that we have to leave behind and we have to help other people leave behind if we're going to move forward. And this is what I was telling this rector in this church in Manhattan. But the first one is, uh, and this speaks directly to the, to the uh, two-state issue. The first one is Israel uh, is willing and interested in having a sovereign Palestinian state on its borders and the two states living side by side in peace and security. It has never, never been the policy of the state of Israel. We're talking from 1948 on and actually pre-Israel in terms of the, the, Zion, the whole Zionist program, Ben-Gurion and his gang, from the 30s, before Hitler, by the way. It has never been the policy of the state of Israel operating as representatives of the Zionist movement to have a Palestinian state and have a sovereign Palestine. It does not figure with Zionism. There cannot be Palestinians. It's been, you know, Golda Meir famously said that. There cannot be a Palestine. And the existence of the indigenous 
Arab population of Palestine, called the Palestinians, is a problem for Israel as a Jewish state founded on the principles of Zionism. It's never been a policy of the state of Israel. Menachem Begin told Jimmy Carter that in the 70s. While they were sitting at Camp David, figuring out the plan for the two-state solution. And so, and our government has been in lockstep with that policy, again, under the surface, underneath the diplo speak, forever. Doesn't matter whether you've got a Democrat, a Republican, a white man, a black woman in the White House, it does not matter. We have been in lockstep with the policy of the State of Israel, and it is a colonialist, colonialist expansionist, racist, ethnic cleansing policy, and now in the case of Gaza, a genocidal policy. And the word that had shocked this fellow was the word, was the word genocide. He said, he wrote to me, he said, do you really believe that the government of, the, of, of Israel really wants to kill all the people in Gaza? I said, no, I don't believe that, but that's not the definition of genocide. Genocide means a systematic program of destroying or eliminating a culture, a civilization, the opportunity for growth, dislocation, ethnic cleansing, which does not necessarily mean extermination camps. There are lots of ways to do that. What Israel is doing meets the definition of genocide. And I didn't say it. Ilan Pape, uh, is, is one of the Israeli new historians, has been saying it for years. And now he talks about incremental genocide. And in 2008, he stood before us in Boston and said, pleading with us, he said, what you're seeing with Castled is just the beginning. Help us. Save my country. Do something about this, because this is just the beginning. So that's line number one. Israel wants a Palestinian state. Not true. Line number two, the United States is an honest broker to this process of a Palestinian entity, which doesn't exist. They work for us, not for the Palestinians, and the state of Israel, which works with us and we work with them, to negotiate this solution. Of course, the United States is not an honest broker. The United States is Israel's lawyer and Israel's banker. That's been clear for decades and continues to be clear until we do something about it so that we can give even somebody like Barack Obama the political backup and capital that he needs to do what he always knew was right, but then he became president, and guess what? There's another myth, or another, I would call it maybe a misconception that we need to talk about, and maybe the most important thing that we have to talk about. And that is that for us, as Americans, as American Jews, as Christians, certainly as Christians, uh, this is an issue of interfaith dialogue, communication, and reconciliation. After all, Israel is a Jewish state. After all, I'm a Christian. I certainly bear an enormous amount of responsibility for what my, you know, what the churches did to the Jews for 2,000 years. Uh, Israel is our, uh, is their reward for their suffering, and it's our gift and offering to the Jews for that suffering. Uh, for their dream of liberation, for their safe haven. Who are we to say anything about Israel? And besides, when we do, it really messes up the relationship. It really threatens to destroy decades since the Second World War, decades of interfaith reconciliation. And by the way, it does. I talked about that at length this afternoon with a group of mostly clergy who if they were not asking me the question, were asking themselves the question, how can I get involved in this struggle without messing up the, my relationship with the rabbi down the street, without institutionally getting my denomination in deep, deep trouble institutionally with the Jewish denominations and with the Jewish leadership? I'll give you the short answer. You can't. Not the way it's been set up, not the way it's been set up by the Jewish establishment, the Jewish institutional establishment, and not the way it's been set up by the, uh, the leadership of the Christian denominations, all of whom are deeply committed to holding the line on not rocking the boat of Jewish-Christian relations in this country. 
And I will tell you that if you believe in human rights, you gotta rock that boat. It's already rocking. And that's a, that's a difficult, um, it's difficult for some people to swallow and to handle because it's painful. There are rules. There's something famously uh, that Mark Ellis, a Jewish liberation theologian, famously called the ecumenical deal. I, I, it really should be called the interfaith deal. And the interfaith deal says, uh, we Jews, we're not gonna let you off the hook, never. After all, we need our victimhood. We will never let you off the hook for what you did to us. But we will talk to you, and we will um, build bonds of trust and reconciliation with you, but stay away from Israel. Don't meddle in our business. That's the deal. Those are the rules. They're unspoken rules. Sometimes they're actually spoken. Um, it's time to break those rules. I believe that up until recently, we've been living in what theologians and sociologists and historians have been called the post-Holocaust era, where all the, the, the rules of theology and interfaith relations changed after Auschwitz. And that has continued to dominate the discourse. Now, there is a lot to learn from Auschwitz especially for the Christian West, because that was a direct result of Western Christian anti-Semitism. Make no mistake. <laughs> but one thing you don't learn from Auschwitz is that it's OK to turn around and do it to somebody else. And the people, Israelis included, who understand that know that Israel and where the Zionist project has taken them is a disaster. And there's no future to it. And it is not the answer to anti-Semitism. Now, I understand that at the end of the 19th century, in Central and Eastern Europe, where it was clear that the emancipation of the Jews was not working, and that it was a bad place for Jews to be, that the idea of an ethnic nationalist movement made a lot of sense, because that's what everybody else was doing. Nationalism was a typecast. It was the solution. So we were going to have one, too. It is not the solution in the 21st century. Nationalism, and we're moving away from nationalism, or we're trying to. And ethnic nationalism? And religious ethnic nationalism? I mean, how do we feel about an Islamic state? How do we as Americans feel about any connection between the state and religion? Why is it okay for the Jews? I, better than maybe any, many of the people in this room, understand where Zionism comes from, the deep impulse and yearning that it represents. I regard it as a forgivable, understandable, catastrophic mistake. We're gonna dig ourselves out of this hole. I don't know when, I don't know how, but it's my problem. It's not your problem. It's time for Christians in this country, and I, you know, I, you know, this is a, it's a pretty Christian country, and there are a lot of churches, and there are a lot of people that belong to churches, and the churches are still strong, and they can still make a difference, especially if they're relevant, especially if they understand what the Great Commission is about, and it's not about converting people so they can be in heaven with them. It's about Matthew 25. It's about the widow, the orphan. It's about the least of these, which actually, if you look at the Greek, means people who are down under oppression, people who are cringing, people who have no power. That's who you stand with. That's what God is about. And when the church is really the church, when it's really called to be the church by people like Martin Luther King Jr. and Bill Coffin uh, and, and Desmond Tutu and others, the church is powerful. The, uh, I talked about the South African challenge to the church. 
here's the context in 1985 in South Africa for the churches. The South African government was already on the ropes. The sanctions were starting to have an impact. So they were losing the support of the world, even though they still had Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan on their side, but that was going to end soon. The um, cities um, the, were exploding. The outlawed ANC uh, was massing armed militias all along the borders of the country. It was looking bad. So what did they do? They said, let's reform. Let's offer reforms. So they said, OK, we'll have blacks in our parliament. Of course, their vote will count for one quarter of that of a white man, but OK, we'll have blacks in the parliament. And we'll give you your own country. It's called the homelands. It's called the Bantustans. It was a two-state solution, separate but equal solution. It was reform. It was moderation. And it was racism. And it was a way to hold on to the evil racist structure. It's classic. The church said no. The world said no. I mentioned this before. In 1963, sitting in jail in Birmingham, Alabama, Martin Luther King said no to a moderate solution. Let's work with the kinder, gentler segregationist new mayor of Birmingham. And by the way, get out of town. We don't like your outside agitators. And you remember what he said to that? He said, hmm, that's kind of what they said to the early Christians, wasn't it? And then you wiped the dust off your shoes and you kept going. You went to the next town. And then you came back to Birmingham. So we're confronting that today as well by liberal, progressive people who, by the way, are progressive 100% on every other issue except when it comes to Israel. Jews and Christians. You've got a guy like Peter Beinert, who is um, a Jew, a Zionist, but um, fancies himself a liberal Zionist. And so we, now we have liberal Zionism, which says, OK, look, Zionism is not bad. It's just that we screwed it up. The occupation, that messed up Zionism. There is a good Israel if we can get cut out the cancer of the settlers and the fanatics. And we'll go back to having our Jewish state. OK, he's wrong about that. The settlers are the, and the settlements and the Bantustanization of what's left of Palestine is a direct outgrowth of the policies of the state of Israel. It's where Israel has always been going. There is no good, and Peter Binder, he says, he says there's a good Israel and there's a bad Israel. That's, I don't want to say it in church. But that's the challenge. That's the challenge that was faced by the Presbyterians in Detroit six months ago when uh, people within the church itself, as well as from the Jewish establishment, said, look, we, we agree with you 100%. It's terrible what's happening to the Palestinians. But don't do this divestment thing. That's going to spoil the relationship. Let's work together. Let's invest positively in the companies that want to help build the Palestinian economy, which basically means a colonial economy within Palestine that serves Israel, but never mind. The Presbyterians by a hair said no to that. And believe me, they're going to get it. Because the other, the other side is, is, is just getting ready to fight the battle more. That's our challenge today. It's, it's the moderates who are saying, no, violent, no nonviolent direct action. Let's work through channels. Let's go slow. And in the meantime, let's go along to get along. Uh, Elon, so there are a couple books I want to recommend to you. First of all, if you want to learn more about the relationship between the United, United States policy and Israeli policy, read Rashid Khalidi's Brokers of Deceit. Khalidi, K-H-A-L-I-D-I. He's the Edward Said professor of, uh, I forget what the title is, but he's at Columbia. He's written wonderful books. And he tells a story, and it's a sad, upsetting story of United States policy going back uh, as far as the 70s and before that. And read Ilan Pape. Read The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine. Read his latest book, The, the Idea of Israel. 
And he makes, he makes some very, very profound and important statements there. He said, we've got to stop thinking about 67 and the occupation. The occupation is the logical, inevitable outcome of 1948, which was a campaign of ethnic cleansing. Not that there were not hostile Arab armies that were there to kill Jewish Israelis. That's certainly true. But if you read the history, you understand that what was really going on was a campaign that had been planned from the 30s to rid the land of non-Jews. And the war was an opportunity to do that, and it had been planned. So what Pape is saying is, stop talking about occupation. Start talking about colonialism, because that's what we're dealing with. And as long as you talk about 67 and occupation, you are basically legitimizing 1948, which was ethnic cleansing and land theft. Because if you say, well, let's pull back from the occupation, that means you're back to the 1948 armistice, 49 armistice lines, which says a couple of things. First of all, it says you can take all that land and the refugees remain refugees in perpetuity unprecedented. People displaced by war, now four and five generations hence, with no opportunity for repatriation or even acknowledgement that they lost something? How can that be? How can we accept that? We can't. The Palestinians won't, and we shouldn't. So this is the point where my friend, the rector at the Church of Manhattan, is like, oh my god, stop, please, where's hope? What do we do? Well, we keep doing what we're doing. We support the Palestinian civil society call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions. We continue to advocate with our elected representatives for a different policy. Now, those of you who have been involved in this know what a, how hard it is to maintain hope and to keep going when you're facing the United States Congress on something like this. But I'm here to tell you it's not hopeless. There are people, you can count them on two hands, who have done the equivalent, if you're talking in the context of the United States Congress, of acts that resemble to some extent, moral backbone and political will. There's hope. They're displaying that. They don't turn up for a particular vote. That's the extent of it. They, they, they decline to sign a letter that APAC has sent to them, which, I mean, it is courageous because supposedly that's political suicide. There are those, but they need us. They need to know that there are constituents behind them. It's simple. That's how it works. You have to go back to, when I don't remember what year it was, but when Martin Luther King Jr. and his lieutenants visited Lyndon Johnson. He said, we need a voting. They said, help us with the Voting Rights Act bill. And he said, I believe, I, I agree with you. We need a Voting Rights Act bill. Make me do it. That's what Johnson said to them. Make me do it. We have to make them do it. That's the way it works. Politicians work like this. Which way is the wind blowing? Combine that with BDS, which in some ways I think is more important because I don't think that political advocacy will go anywhere without a sense that at the grassroots, people aren't happy with Israel. When you refuse to buy an Israeli product, it's not necessarily going to hurt that company, but it's going to make people wonder, well, what is it about Israel? Why are we boycotting Israel? I thought we boycott, we didn't boycott our friends. Israel's not our friend? Why not? What's Israel doing? And when the Presbyterians divest several million dollars worth of holdings in three companies, it doesn't matter to those companies. If it did, the companies would have responded to the threat and changed their policies. They didn't. They didn't care. It didn't matter to them. It's a couple million dollars in shares. But it's an earthquake in American society. We need to keep those aftershocks happening, and we need new earthquakes. The Episcopal Church is going to do it someday. The UCC? is probably going to pass something like that in their next uh, conference, in their next an uh, uh, annual conference. Um, those of you here from the UCC, work through your denominations. You Episcopalians, work through your denominations. Someday, the Lutherans will do it. 
despite the fact that you have a presiding bishop that declined to allow, to, to endorse a vigil for the victims of the Gaza war, including the Jewish victims, in the middle of the summer, and in, a, in an official statement said, in, in a statement startling in its bluntness, relations are really strained with the Jewish community these days. That's what she said. She gave them. You know what? If you're a Lutheran, you elected her. Tell her what you think about that. So these things will make a difference. Um, let me just end by telling you a little bit about Kairos again. So we started off in 19, well, Kairos started off Gospel of Mark uh, in the very beginning of the Gospel, where John the Baptist is coming and he says, the time has been fulfilled, uh, you know, spread the good news, repent and spread the good news, which means it's time to change your minds around and something new is coming. This is a big announcement. He, the word he used for the times are kairos, which the South Africans translated as a moment of grace and opportunity when God issues a challenge for decisive action. Beautiful words, and we quoted in the 2011 response to the Palestinian kairos document, which is called a time for action. So in 2009, the Palestinians wrote their own document, and this is our answer to it. That's the booklet that um, uh, I think it was R Ralph or um, Bob was saying is, is available outside. There's also a brochure that tells you more about Kairos USA. This is a movement to unite and mobilize Americans, American Christians, uh, to stand with one another and in support of the Palestinian call for liberation, a call that is made on theological grounds. Now, there is a political struggle here, but there's also a theological struggle. And politics and theology come together, just like they always do when it's important, just like they did in the first century when Jesus walks on the scene of enormous political urgency and enormous human suffering at the hands of a merciless, murderous, empire. That's the context of his ministry. That's what the Gospels are about. That's what the Great Commission is about. Jesus was a Palestinian Jew living under Roman occupation. His people were suffering. And more than that, hope was being taken away from them because Rome was saying, do not worship God, leave the Torah, which is a civil code of compassion that believes in equality. Leave the Torah behind, worship the emperor, feed the empire, feed the priests and the Jewish aristocracy working for us in Jerusalem. And when Jesus stood before that temple and said, every stone must come down and be replaced with my body, he meant this system is no good. This system must be replaced with a system, with body of Christ, one humanity united in equality. That's the kingdom of God. Politics and religion didn't have to converge them. They were the same thing. This is such an opportunity. This is a redemptive cause for the church. It's the most urgent cause facing our society today and facing the churches as potentially the leaders in that struggle. And we all have an opportunity to be part of that. That's the whole mission of Kairos USA. So I encourage you to take the, um, take the brochure, uh, go to the website and you can uh, find the, the document, there's a whole study course, there's lots of things that can be done in your communities. And there's, there's something happening here in Portland as well in terms of bringing people together so that there can be a sense of united effort within Portland, across denominations, in common cause with you know, secular as well as church-affiliated folks. Um, if there are any Jews who want to join in, that's fine, but I want to point out to you again, this is not an interfaith project. This is not about Jews and Christians and Muslims getting along. This is not a religious struggle, even though people are bringing religion into it. It's a human rights struggle. And the faith communities have a role to play. It is not an interfaith issue. And if you are not willing, and I can't tell you what to do, if you are not willing to put those relationships at risk, because you will be called the worst name you can be called, which is anti-Semite. 
then you better find another cause. But as long as what's happening for Palestinians today at the hands of Israel and the United States, as long as that's happening, there ain't going to be peace in the world, and other human rights causes are not going to flourish, even the domestic ones. We can't be letting this happen. It's here. It's at home. It's happening to us here today. There's Palestinians in our backyard. It is our backyard. So I think we really need to take this cause on. And if you get together here in Portland and work in common cause, then you are in solidarity with Palestinians and you're in solidarity with Kairos movements across the world, Germany, the UK, South Korea, South Africa, Nigeria, the Philippines, Brazil, Canada, India, everywhere. We're all going to be coming together in Bethlehem in December for the fifth anniversary of the Palestine Kairos document. It is a global movement. It's very exciting, and it's very hard. And it's hard to predict what's going to happen because there are huge forces arrayed against us. Um, but as Martin Luther King said, uh, there's only one direction that this can go in. And as Jesus said, in Luke chapter 12, do you think that I've come to bring peace? Not at all. I've come to bring, and then it's hard to translate the word, I've come to bring division. <laughs> Meaning, if you're going to have peace, there's going to be arguments. You've got to take sides. You can't be on the fence about this one. Uh, there's no neutrality. There's no, let's listen to both sides, bring them together, have them understand each other's narratives, and it's going to be OK. For my people, for the Jews, often the, uh, the objection is, and I think Ralph alluded to it, <clears throat> well, we'll have, a, we'll have a, quote, pro-Palestinian speaker come, but then you've got to have a pro-Israel speaker come. That's fine. What I'm often told is, well, how about the other side? What's the Jewish story? Jewish story, presumably, is we have suffered so much, which means that we are innocent of any wrongdoing. That is the Jewish story that, that we were supposed to believe. Okay? The Jewish story is the story of our suffering. The Jewish story is the, is the Holocaust. I never call it the Holocaust, capital H. That implies that we own genocide. We own suffering. We don't. There are other Holocausts. There are other genocides. They're happening now. They will happen in the future. We don't own it. But that's supposedly the Jewish story. I will tell you what the Jewish story is today. We've left the post-Holocaust era. We are in the post-Nakba era. The Jewish story today is the story of what we have done and are continuing to do to another people and to another civilization. That's our problem. But there's only one story. Sometimes there's a perpetrator and there's a victim. Right now, there's a perpetrator and there's a victim. You know what? The Palestinians could be empowered tomorrow. They'd probably turn around and do it to somebody else. But that's not what's happening. We need to look out for the least of these right now, for the people who are under the wheel and who are being oppressed. And to ignore that is to ignore that at our peril. Thank you. So one, one interesting fact is that, you know, Israel really basically, it, 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 Hamas is Israel's creation. Hamas was a little known um, an, uh, organization, grassroots organization in Palestine, uh, not, not particularly connected to Syria or anybody else, uh, back in the uh, 80s when uh, the bad guys uh, were the PLO and Fatah. They were still the terrorists. And Israel supported Hamas uh, as a, a way to try to disempower Fatah and neutralize them to some extent. So the baby grew up and now has become the bad guy. Now, Hamas has a charter that's an ugly thing. It says all kinds of things that make people really uncomfortable. You don't even have to be Jewish to be made uncomfortable by Hamas's charter. Hamas, um, and, and it is Islamist in that sense, at the same time, it has de facto recognized Israel by participating in the elections in 2006, which where it won the majority of the seats, at which point all of them were imprisoned or expelled from the country. And then the election, which was fair, the most fair election that Jimmy Carter said he'd ever seen in Palestine, was basically invalidated, and the present government is illegitimate. 
So Hamas has a moderate, has a moderate um, faction that would probably do a pretty good job of ruling the Palestinians, at least as good as any other Arab government that you've got out there, which means not great, but would recognize Israel and would disavow uh, any of the terrorist activities which were carried out by rogue forces within Hamas. Those are the ones that are encouraged and supported and empowered by the continuing oppression of the Palestinian people. That's the way it works. Hamas took over Gaza um, as a preemptive strike uh, against our Fatah strongman who was going to be put in power by, the, by Israel and the United States. And so Hamas got wind of that and they came in and took over Gaza. Uh, and they're probably the most moderating force in Gaza right now. Now, do they have rhetoric that sounds ugly? Yes, but if you really listen to the Hamas guys when, they, when they're interviewed in international, uh, in international media, they sound like resistance fighters that in any other context we would say, you go. We would support. They would say, we will stop resisting violently, which is our right, when we get our rights back, when Israel stops oppressing us. Um, Hamas happens to have the right to resist violently, like any other resistance movement. And I think it's an absolute truism that one man's or one person's uh, terrorist is another person's uh, freedom fighter. So you want to, um, you want to get rid of Hamas? Uh, stop uh, stealing Palestinian land and give Palestinians human rights either in a uh, multi-ethnic, truly democratic state or in a state of their own, which they are even willing to accept, even though it would be a, just pitiful, pitiful crumbs.